what you're looking at right now is a port fuel injection engine. All right. So how am I saying that this is a port fuel injection? Or how can you identify this is a port fuel injection? Can anyone tell me? Looking at the geometry, how can you tell that it, this is a port fuel injected in, port fuel injected engine? injectors to the ports that's correct so for example if you look at look at this this cad model right here you do see the injector right so this is where the injector is basically connected to the port now what is weird about this engine does do you, when you look at this do you find something weird about this engine is there anything weird or is there anything different about this engine when compared to the engine that you find in a car or a bike what is missing in this engine so the question is <clears throat> when you look at this engine does it look okay or is there anything weird about this engine vishnu krishnan spark plug is missing that's true but if i look inside the engine the spark plug is right there so vishnu i hope you can see the spark plug right now right do you see this do you see the spark plug so what else is weird about this engine or if you feel like there is nothing weird about the engine just that that is also a valid answer again uh, guys i really want this to be an interactive session because else the topic would be pretty hard to understand anirudh the camshaft is missing that's pretty neat cool that's correct what else is missing in this engine so vishnu anirudh and uh, uh vishnu anirudh and aravind are you guys in a quiet atmosphere do you guys directly want to talk to me instead of typing if you are in a quiet atmosphere just tell me that and you can i will just unmute you so you will directly be able to talk to me and answer the questions because i see that aravind rajan is sitting outside so he might not be in a quiet place but vishnu i feel like you are sitting in your home how about anirudh how are you how like uh, what's your position Oh, oh! It's you in the library, so it's a quiet place, but you won't be able to talk. That's fine. So I think Vishnu, uh, just give me a second. I'm going to get my headphones and I'll unmute you. Okay, so you can directly talk to me. All right, guys. I'm back. Uh, Vishnu, let me just mute you. Okay, unmute you. So, Vishnu, you should be able to speak right now. Why don't you try? Ah, uh, you're not audible. It seems like you're connected from two devices. <clears throat> Okay, uh, Vishnu, do you want to try speaking now? Uh, am I audible now? Yes, perfect. A little bit more louder, please. Okay. Okay. Yeah, just have it. Just have the microphone near you so that you can answer the questions. All right, Vishnu. So, what is it? What is? What do you find weird about this particular engine? Uh, is there a hold for injectors on both the manifolds? Inlet and outlet? well, one side is intake, the other side is exhaust. So. 
there has to be the injector mount is going to be only on one side okay do you find anything wrong with it any any other thing any other thing wrong with it if no you can just say it i i didn't actually recognize anything wrong with it cool so <clears throat> the 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 fundamental thing that you you should see is this is actually not an engine that you would find in a bike meaning for example if you look at an engine in a bike what is the first thing that you see well you see a fin structure right you see the cylinder head block and the engine block you will first notice that there's no engine block correct and the injector physical injector is located you don't see that the spark plug protrudes you don't see the spark plug <clears throat> well that is because we are interested in simulating in what is we are interested in simulating what's happening inside the engine right so we have constructed the cad model in such a way that you are taking only the interior parts with which the fluid is going to interact this is what you call as the wet volume w e t wet volume all right so this is the first thing that you need to learn about simulating any engine if you are simulating the flow inside the engine only you need that volume having your engine block having your tail pipe none of those things matter you have to delete them correct so that is step number 1 and the other thing is if you just hide let me just hide a few triangles here so you can and if i disable the edges <clears throat> you can see the flow path much more clearly right so you can see that the flow is coming in your port fuel the way the port fuel injection works is it's going to inject the fuel in the back side of the valve all right and then the valve is going to open and all that stuff similarly on the exhaust side if i just hide you will be able to see that flow path as well and clearly the intake and exhaust ports have dis have distinguishing characteristics and that's basically it this is the entire region with which the fluid meaning the air fuel mixture the and the burnt products are going to interact all right so this is step number 1 this is a wet volume now if i enable the edges again you will see that there's lot of you know triangles right the geometry is made up of small long small medium and long triangles right if you if i just zoom out you can see that there are long triangles here there are really small triangles here and if i zoom in a little bit more you have even more smaller triangles right so this is what you call as a stereo lithographic file all right i'll just write it here it's called s t l stereo lithographic file this is one of the most commonly used and really really old cad formats it's an interchanging format meaning if you have a cad package you have a cad package cad package and i have a cad package in order for us to transfer data stl is kind of a neutral format just like step or ijs correct so this is very popular for cfd and fe analysis because it already contains triangles with which it's quite easy to apply boundary conditions <coughs> okay so when we look at this model if i zoom if i rotate the model you can see that there are some missing portions right there is a hole and if i basically maybe go on this side there are a few more holes in the geometry this is what you call as surface defects so when you are working on a cad model right say that you are familiar with solid works or cat ai or nx cad if you are creating your own engine design and if you export a stl file the triangulated in surface will have some problems right these are called as surface defects now this is not going to happen only for you you know when like if you if you take a look at engineers in general motors or engineers in ford when they are working with models they have problems right these are the types of problems so the first problem is holes in the geometry so if i just click on this triangle and rotate sorry about that if i just click on this triangle and rotate about it you can see that there is a hole right so when there is a hole in the geometry you cannot simulate the fluid flow why because your fluid simulation software doesn't know what is inside and what is outside that, I, i'm not sure if that makes sense but if you think about it <clears throat> when you are simulating something you need to create a computational mesh since we are trying to simulate the flow inside the engine the computational mesh needs to be inside the model all right uh the other thing is the other question that i want to ask is in an engine we are interested in simulating the flow and we are also interested in simulating combustion 
what is the mathematical background that you need to understand how this works can anyone tell me what is the mathematics behind all of this or what is the physics behind all of this can anyone answer vishnu you can use your microphone if you want if you want or if you want to type in an answer that's fine as well but arvind and anirudh you guys can type in your answer the question is what is the mathematical background you need or what is the physics that you need to simulate flow and combustion inside an engine again guys i would really want all of you to in be like interact so that you know the workshop actually is useful if i keep on talking then it might not be great okay that's fine thank you for being honest vishnu how about arvind how about anirudh do you guys know how you can actually what is the physics or mathematics behind simulating flow and combustion arvind thank you for your honesty as well that's fine <clears throat> so anirudh it is just it is just you <clears throat> okay so i'm just going to assume that anirudh doesn't know the answer so let me just explain so this process of simulating flow and combustion in an engine is called as cfd right do you guys know what cfd is does anyone know what cfd stands for exactly right cfd stands for computational fluid dynamics so what what does cfd mean well you're taking fluid dynamics equations and you are solving those equations using a computer right so let's actually open one note here because i think that will make my life a bit more easy <clears throat> so the first step in cfd or engine simulation is to understand fundamental principles so when when flow is taking place what are the fundamental laws that should not be broken can you think of those laws it's very similar to thermodynamics what are some of the fundamental laws these are called as first principles you sh you should never break them what are some of the fundamental principles there are three very very important fundamental principles i'll give one clue the first one is mass is conserved what about the other two arvind anirudh vishnu can you guys guess the second one exactly so energy is typically the third one so what you're saying is mass can neither be created nor be destroyed so the idea is very simple so for example say that you have a bucket like this you know if 1 kg if mass is flowing at the rate of 1 kg per second right if the bucket is closed and if you're keeping on filling and say that there's a hole from which the water is leaking out what is the rate at which the water should leak out same rate right so this is mass conservation similarly if you take a system like this and you are basically feeding in energy at the rate of 1 joule per second and then you basically close the inlet so initially there was a inlet but then what you do is you put a box you put a valve and then you close it so this 1 joule per second that was there is going to get it's going to get transferred outside through heat transfer correct what would be the total heat transfer well it would be 1 joule per second right so this is energy conservation similarly the other concept that is important is momentum conservation now 
when we take up these simple examples right like if you know if you assume number 1 kg per second 1 joule per second or 1 newton force then it's very easy but the problem is if you're taking just no numbers as an example you cannot write an equation right the whole idea behind mathematics and physics is to describe these concepts using formulas right mm -hmm. so that everyone is consistent for example say someone in india is talking about mass conservation if they write the equation what they are saying and what uh, what someone else in the us or europe is saying is the same thing right so that is why you have this you ha you have to basically follow those mathematical rules and define everything that way there are there's no misunderstanding so you, when you take the mass conservation and if you write it in its differential form you basically get an equation like this what is this equation called does anyone know <clears throat> again if you guys are in I, I i believe most of you have most of you are currently in third year so you should know what this equation is arvind rajan euler's equation no that's not correct mass balance equation that's correct what is it called what is the what is the most famous name for it okay this is the continuity equation right similarly first of all this is a partial differential equation correct because you are writing it in a very small element if you are trying to put this rule in a small element you get a partial derivative form similarly momentum equation is a little bit more complex so you have a time derivative chain <coughs> term which basically says the rate of change of velocity plus you have this crazy looking or complex looking derivatives <clears throat> now this is a very i know that this is this can look very complex so this is a partial differential equation correct this is a part both of these are partial differential equations if you can take these two equations and if you can solve it in an engine you are you can basically predict the flow through the engine that's it does it make sense similarly you have an equation for energy that's called as the energy conservation equation and the way that's going to look is you you'll have dou by dou t of energy plus if i use some uh, uh shortcuts then you'll have uh, you'll have terms like this right so you'll have this is the convective term but the convection of energy correct and you'll have the right hand side term <clears throat> so when you solve this equation also you can simulate how combustion is taking place that statement is not 100% true but uh, it is an easier way to understand because the name is an energy equation right so when you solve the energy equation you can predict the heat release also right just think of it like that now these equations these equations are what you call as the navier stokes equations the ns equations now a small correction there historically like to be 100% accurate only the momentum equation is the navier stokes equation all right so if someone is asking you what the navier stokes equation is you can just say it is nothing but momentum balance or fluid flow that's it but his, but over time people like you know all the engineers when they started talking nowadays the lingo or the language is that when people say navier stokes it's the they they they're clubbing in all the equations continuity energy and also the momentum so these are what you call as the governing fluid flow equations or you can say that these are the governing fluid dynamics right now to now what is cft well you take this fluid dynamics equations and you solve it using a computer that's it that is what cft is now the idea is quite simple so let me just uh, you know explain it in a very visual way so for example this looks i hope that this looks like a computer correct so let us say this is a computer now if you take a partial differential equation and if you throw it at a computer can it solve it does a computer know how to solve partial differential equations 
not re- exactly right it cannot so the computer cannot solve it so how will you solve the fluid flow equations well you need to convert it into a form and when you can this is called the desired form right so you convert it into a desired form and when you can throw it throw it throw that at the computer then you will be able to solve it how do you get this desired form well that is the concept of discretization now you might have heard now you might have heard of techniques like finite difference method finite volume method finite element method correct so these are concepts that we study left and right well these are nothing but discretization techniques they are nothing but equations or methods that you solve that you use to solve pds that's it that's basically it so when we say finite element method that doesn't mean that we are talking about you know uh <clears throat> structural analysis it has got nothing to do with the type of application these are just techniques for solving pds okay so a little bit more explanation about discretization so let us say we take a simple pd correct so uh, we'll say something like dy by dx is equal to e power x right what is the solution to this e- solution to this ordinary differential equation dy by dx equal to e power x what is the solution to this ordinary differential equations Vishnu, Arvind, do you guys know the answer for this question? Exactly right. Uh, y equal to e power x. So this is what you call as an exact solution, correct? Why is this an exact solution? Well, depending upon the value of x. you can put any value of x 1e minus 9 1e power 10 1e power 100 you will always get the value for y correct and this is what you call as a continuous solution meaning at any x location you can get the answer but in the process of discre- uh, discretization we no longer have you we no longer have a continuous domain so what we basically say is okay if i have do y by do x equal to e power x i will just approximate do y by do x as y uh, at x plus delta x minus y at x divided by uh, d- delta x equal to e power x right we have all studied this formula correct so here what you can do is to calculate y x plus delta x e power x times delta x plus y power x correct this is the update rule so here you need to understand that for any given value of x i can calculate the value of y but the problem is the answer is sensitive to delta x right and in order to do this how would you go about the calculations so this is a e power x curve it's going to look something like this now what you are doing is you are taking two points this is x and this is x plus delta x correct the difference between the two points is delta x and you are take you are saying that you are computing dy by dx which is the slope correct you are computing the slope you are approximating the slope with these two points now we need to understand that as delta x becomes smaller and smaller the the value of the slope will change and eventually it will be accurate does it make sense this is what you call as discretization and this delta x is what you call as the mesh okay so when people talk about computational mesh it is basically the size the, uh it is it is basically the gap size in your domain meaning this is one mesh point this is one mesh point the value of your function is evaluated here it's evaluated here but it's not evaluated in between this is what you call as the discrete this is what you call as discrete right what does discrete mean in english it means specific points what does continuous mean continuous means any point right it can be any any point so between this point and this point there are infinite number of points that is what continuous means but discrete means countable you can count the number of points and only when you convert the equation in that form you can solve it using a computer this is what you call as discretization <clears throat> i hope that, that makes sense so this is kind of a very basic class on computational fluid dynamics all right 
So when you are able to solve this thing, then you can calculate your velocity, pressure, temperature, and whatever variable you want. And in this case, we have a 3D geometry, right? So the mesh will also be three dimensional. All right. So that's what you call as a 3D mesh. So the first thing that you will have to do is you'll have to take this particular geometry and you need to first split this geometry into several useful parts so that I can assign boundary conditions. Why? Because for example, if you look at Vishnu Krishna's answer, he's saying that y equal to e power x plus c, right? Which is correct. How will you, de how will you determine the value of c using a boundary condition, correct Vishnu? Right, you provide a boundary condition. You say something like at x is equal to zero, y is equal to something, correct? Similarly, when you solve your uh, Navier-Stokes equation, right, you will have a boundary condition for velocity, for pressure, for temperature, and so on. Now, instead of at a, instead of specifying the pressure, velocity, temperature in one point, you are specifying the velocity, pressure, and temperature at the inlet phase, the velocity, pressure, and temperature at the outlet phase, the velocity, pressure, and temperature at the piston, at the spark plug, and so on. So this means you need to first take your entire domain and split it into useful parts so that you can assign these boundary conditions. So here, the first thing I need to do is, you can see that all the triangles are belonging to a single part. I need to first break it and I need to create multiple parts. So the software that I'm using here is Convert CFD. This is like the industry standard for IC engine simulations. So I go to flagging tool and now what I'm going to do is I'm just going to create a few boundaries, right? And once I create a few boundaries, I'll be able to select the boundaries that I want and I'm just going to apply. So for example, this right here is piston, correct? The reason I'm separating piston is so that I can give it separate boundary condition because the piston is going to move up and down, correct? So I've selected my piston. Now, what is this vertical section called in an engine? Does anyone know? What is this called? Okay, looks like we have an answer. Let me check. Uh, sleeve. Uh, very close. It's not really the sleeve. This is called as the... Do you want to try again, Vishnu? It starts with L. L dash 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 dash. It's called as the liner, correct? I think I, I think I left one dash. <laughs> so yeah, but this is the liner, correct? You might have heard of it. So this is your liner. So the liner needs to be a separate boundary. So what I'm going to do is, uh, let me just create that separate boundary. So since the geometry is triangulated, I have some tools in Convert Studio, which will help me in selecting my triangles. So I'm creating something called as a boundary films, uh, which will actually help me select you know, if I use the boundary fence method for triangle selection, I can just select this guy and click apply. Right, so this would be my liner boundary, correct? Now the nice thing about, you know, from a software point of view, the nice thing about Converge is it's very powerful in handling complex geometries. So I can, once I've flagged two boundaries, I can just hide them, right? So that I can look at what's going on inside. Here you can see that the fire deck is there. The fire deck is nothing but the combustion chamber. Look at how complex that is. This is a very realistic looking engine geometry. And all the parts and all the things, all the shape, all the structures that you see are realistic. <clears throat> okay. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to enable the edges again. And this time I'm going to see, <clears throat> uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to basically flag uh, my exhaust port. So what I'm going to do is, I'm going to go to fence and I'm going to create a boundary fence. A boundary fence is basically I'm selecting an edge. I'm selecting an edge and I'm creating a fence there, right? So just like you're creating a fence outside your house, right? Which is basically a boundary. You're creating a fence on the geometry. So you can see that when I create a fence, you have this white color. Similarly, what I can do is I can go to the end and uh, actually not to the end. This should be enough. Maybe on the other side, what I can do is I can create a fence somewhere there and hit enter. I have the same fence, correct? 
So now if I go to boundary fence and select this, you can see that my exhaust port alone has been selected. The nice thing about the boundary fence and the white lines that we're drawing, what that is doing is, it is basically preventing the triangle selection from going inside. So wherever there is a fence, the triangle selection will stop there. Does that make sense? So for example, let me just uh, undo this. So I'm going to clean. So when I click on clean, all of my boundary fences would get deleted, right? So now if I go out and if I select, what's happening? Uh, if I go and select, you can see that the entire geometry is getting selected, right? I don't want that. I want only the ports to be selected. So what I'm doing is I'm going to go back to fence again. I'm creating an arc here and also here. And then if I go to flag, use the boundary fence method, the selection is stopping here. I hope this makes sense guys. And then what I can do is I can just click apply to a different boundary. And this boundary is going to be called as exhaust port. All right. So I've, let me hide the, hide the exhaust port as well. <clears throat> so you can follow a similar process. You can follow a similar process. And at the end of the day, what you will have is you will have a complete port fuel injection setup. So this is how the geometry is going to look like. <clears throat> All right. So this is the final end product. So what I've done is I flagged everything, right? And if I hide the exhaust port, you, sorry, the intake port, you can see the intake valves have also been flagged. Similarly, if I hide the exhaust port, I can also flag, I can also show, see that, right? So this is what you call as a boundary flagging. So similarly, if I hide the piston, you can see inside and you can see the spark plug on all the valves. All right. So this is what you would call as a completely flagged surface. Now guys, any questions till this point? Vishnu and Aravind, do you guys have any questions that you want to ask? Is it clear, Vishnu? What are you saying? Uh, like, is it clear? Okay, what materials are used in this chamber? Well, <laughs> that doesn't matter, right? Because you're interested in only simulating the flow inside, right? Inside this volume, which is going to be your air and fuel mixture. The outside material, it doesn't matter. Since this is a fluid dynamic simulation, you are not worried about if the external surface is made up of cast iron or is it made up of aluminum, it doesn't matter. Does it, does it make sense, Aravind? Okay, perfect. So then what you would do is you would set up the case. The first thing is very easy. This is what you call as the uh, engine geometric parameters. What is the bore? What is the stroke? What is the connecting rod length and all that stuff, right? So very easy to write. So you will write down all that information, which you can typically measure, or you can do some basic calculation to get the answer for it. So once you've done this, you need to basically select what is the fuel. So in this case, I've selected IC8H18 as the fuel. Now that is nothing but what is the, what is the name I, what is the name of IC8 H18? Does anyone know? This is nothing but ISO dash iPhone dash. What is it? Ninety two point eight five. No, not isopropyl alcohol, right? Alcohols have a OH at the end. So this is actually ISO octane. This is an alkane, correct? So this is an octane, <coughs> sorry, alkane. So I'm selecting ISO octane as my fuel. And then I'm having something called as a reaction mechanism. Why do I need this? Well, I'm going to be simulating combustion, correct? So when I'm simulating combustion, then chemical reactions should take place. So I need to provide what those chemical reactions are. So this, this file contains that information. So I'm providing that. And then what I'm doing is I'm going to go and provide boundary conditions. So let's start with the piston, right? So if you look at the piston, the piston is going to be a wall boundary, correct? And the piston is translating, meaning it's going to move up and down, correct? 
and what is the motion how does it move up and down well it's going to follow piston motion we check piston motion and it will follow that uh, if you look at say liner well what is the liner the liner is a wall but it's stationary right the liner is not moving anywhere it is fixed so you're saying stationary uh, what about the spark plug well again the spark plug is a wall the only difference is that the spark plug is at higher temperature 550 kelvin right because it is continuously experiencing combustion right so it's going to be hotter whereas if you look at the piston the piston is at 450 kelvin it's relatively cool right so these type, this is what you call as a boundary condition so here what i'm doing is i'm providing boundary condition for all the parts so let us take the exhaust valve right so if you look at the exhaust valve the exhaust valve is a type wall it's translating but the exhaust valve is also moving right well it does not follow the piston motion how does the exhaust valve move well you have a valve lift profile so for example you have a profile like this which you need to provide and this is how the valve is going to move up and come down all right so this is what you call as the valve lift l i f t valve lift profile this is very important to run an ic engine simulation any questions vishnu you seem like you have a question <laughs> how do we get valve lift profile that's a great question so you can actually do something called as a multi body dynamic simulation have you heard of the term before multi body dynamic simulation okay that's fine so the idea is quite simple <clears throat> so let me just uh, take up my pen here so say that this is a sim one second hmm for some reason this is not allowing me to write i'm just going to close this guy and open it one more time all right there we go so for example let us say that this is an ic engine valve correct what you can do is you can put a spring on top of it and what you can do is if there is a rocker the rocker is going to look like this and there is a camshaft correct something like this you can take up this you can set this simulation using a software called as multi body dynamics multi body dynamics basically solves the dynamics right so you have kinematics and you have dynamics correct so dynamics basically deals with forces so you can actually solve what is the force that's being put here so what is the force that's being put here and for that what is the displacement here you can take all of this information and you can chart time versus lift you will get a profile like this and that profile you take it and feed it into your ic engine simulation okay so there we go we can close this guy again all right so this is how you get a valve lift profile and if you look at other parts it's very similar so for example the intake port is a wall it's stationary the temperature is different uh, if you take a look at the intake valve it's a wall translating moving but it has a intake lift profile right your intake and exhaust has different profiles so you provide that in and then what you do is you set so you set up your spray models now with respect to your spray modeling there is a lot of mathematics since this is an introductory level presentation i'm not going to be talking about this a lot but remember that if this is what you if you are interested in this type of a subject you need to learn all these things for example when a spray comes in right it breaks up correct but because of atomization and then the drop can vaporize the drop can collide the drop can hit a wall it can form a film and it can splash there is a lot of physics you need to understand how those physics are captured before you use it since this is a short workshop we cannot cover all the details but 
make sure that you try to understand it by writing down what is the equation that you are solving and what each and every term in that equation is so if you look at the injector then you basically say all right what is the start of injection how long does the injection last what is the total injected mass you provide that parameter all right so this is how you set up the spray I, again i'm neglecting a lot of details because i feel like it might be too complex i hope you guys are okay with that vishnu and narvind <clears throat> all right what do i do next after simulate after setting up spray i have to set up combustion turbulence and source so in combustion i'm just basically picking some a model called as the sage model right so here if i pick the sage model then what it's doing is it's going to solve that chemical reactions that i showed you like a few minutes back it's going to take out take those chemical reactions it's going to solve that and it's going to predict what are the remaining species what is the product basically it will predict that and these are the parameters to set that up similarly in your ic engine your flow is turbulent correct turbulence basically occurs at very high reynolds number correct to capture turbulence you need a turbulence model that's it so there are several turbulence models standard k epsilon rng k epsilon but for ic engines you typically use rng k epsilon because it works very well so we have selected that model for this particular application and finally we have to set up our computational mesh we are basically saying that our base grid size is 4 mm so what is the base grid well we talked about the concept of mesh right so here what we are saying it saying is at every 4 mm distance we are solving the equations that's it 4 mm is our mesh size that's what we are saying so we are setting it up and then we are setting up something called as adaptive mesh refinement what is adaptive mesh refinement well <clears throat> it's a technique that helps you basically refine the computational mesh only in areas that you require now whatever i said right now might be very complex so i'll give a very simple example i'm pretty sure you all have a smartphone correct you are, you all have a smartphone in your hand and one of the things that smartphone smartphone basically tells is pixel density right so the pixel density is very high that i mean if there is a lot of pixels that's good right now think about it like this say that you are having a white color wallpaper a wallpaper which is white color how many pixels do you need to capture that accurately even if you have one pixel it's enough right because it is just white so that is the same thing now if you are having if you are doing a flow simulation and if there is no change in the flow meaning the flow is stationary that means at every point the velocity is the same well then you just need one mesh point but let us say you take a colored photo now in the colored photo uh, for example you can just look at your screen right now what if you have a mobile phone nearby whatever wallpaper you have if you look at this look at the wallpaper there are certain areas where there's a lot of colors and the colors are continuously changing right now let us say that you put pixels on only those areas well what is the benefit the benefit is that you can get the same clarity with a fewer number of pixels that is the concept of adaptive mesh refinement meaning let me draw a simple example here so say for example uh, i have okay. one note is continuously giving me problems hopefully that goes away so the thing that i'm trying to say is for example say that this is your phone all right and in your phone what i'm doing is i'm basically going to um draw say maybe a shape if possible and we are just going to color this by some whatever color okay and then i'm going to use a different color at this interface and then i'm going to have this uniform color now let us start drawing pixels on top of this for example let us say uh, maybe i can use the black color 
your pixel is going to look like this, correct? It's, it's basically a computational mesh. Now, if you think about it, you have one, two, three, and four pixels, right? Now, if you're removing this one, two, three, and four pixels, and if you just have one pixel there, the result is still going to be the same, correct? That is the concept of adaptive mesh refinement, meaning you basically remove the pixels to make sure that you put pixels only in the area that's required. So in other words, what I can do is I can just keep on dividing this area, right? Because this is where my pixels need to be, correct? Do you guys get the idea? And this is actually a very popular technique. Nowadays, everyone uses that in the industry. So that way you save the computational cells. Your total cell count is optimized. The simulation is much more efficient and you're getting results in a quicker manner. I hope that makes sense. So this is what you call as the adaptive mesh refinement and that is the last part in your simulation. Now, let us talk about running the simulation. Now, if you're running the simulation, you cannot run it on your laptop. You need a supercomputer. Meaning to run the simulation, you need at least 96 GB of RAM and at least 16 cores, which most likely a student does not have. But when you run the simulation, the results look pretty nice. So let me see. Uh, actually, I think I need to go to my Google Drive to show that to you. That's fine. I can do that. Okay, I think I'm running low on memory. So before I do that. Sorry about that, guys. <clears throat> let me just close, just let me just free up a little bit of memory and then I'll start. Yeah, I think this NX CAD is what is causing the problem for some reason. Okay, perfect. So NX CAD is closed. I'm going to be just stopping uh, the screen share in the meantime. Uh, does anyone have any questions? Oh, looks like uh, Vishnu had posted a question. Shouldn't we specify the speed of the piston and valves? Uh, also one more question. Shouldn't we specify? Oh, okay. Repeated the question. So if you look at the speed of the piston, right? How is, how does the, like on what factors does the piston um, motion depend on? Vishnu, can you think of an answer for that? And also Aravind, you can also try answering that. Stroke length, okay. Is that the only parameter? not combustion efficiency rate. So the piston, uh, the piston uh, motion or velocity, it, it is purely geometric. It depends upon the kinematics, meaning it depends on the bore, stroke, connecting rod length and so on. So this is what you call as the slider crank mechanism, right? You might have studied that. So what Converge does is it solves the slider crank mechanism and we do take the engine RPM as an input. 
So for example, here, uh, when I was uh, doing this, when I was setting up the IC engine simulation, in the case setup, when I'm starting a new case setup, right? You can see that crank speed is an input. Based on this crank speed, everything will be calculated. So now let's look at the some results that we're generating. So first we are going to be looking at just the spray simulation. How does the spray look like? So I'll just put in the full screen. So you can see that the parsers are coming in. So this is the fuel injection event. There's breaking up and then the fuel is basically touching the valves. Film is forming and when the valves open because of that strong vacuum, the fuel is sucked in. And there's a, there's a very complex flow path and that is basically because of the turbulence. And then the, flu, and the fuel is basically vaporizing, right? And that is why you can see that the parcels are disappearing but there's some amount of fuel still left. So let's play the video one more time. The parcels are colored by velocity. So red color is high velocity and blue color is low velocity. So when the parcels are hitting the valve, you can see that the velocity will become blue because the velocity is reducing. But when the valve opens, immediately they become red again because of the pressure drop, right? So this level of detail can be captured, right? And this is what engineers are interested in. How do I optimize the flow path of my spray so that it atomizes more effect effectively. And with CFD, you can, if you're doing it correctly, then you can predict these type of things very, very easily. So now let's take a look at, say, the combustion part, right? So we've, we've, all, we've already looked at uh, the intake stroke. So now let's take a look at the combustion. Or oh, before the combustion, maybe since we looked at only the spray, let's look at the gas phase. So how does the gas velocity change? So when the intake stroke changes, look at that. This is how complex the intake mixture is, right? You can see that there's a lot of flow structures and this basically determines the level of turbulence in your domain. Only if the flow is turbulent, you will be able to ignite it properly, right? These are all results from this simulation, the engine that I showed you. Now let's look at a basic combustion simulation. <clears throat> so compression stroke is taking place the piston is slowly coming up, temperature is raising. You're looking at temperature here, right? So the blue thing, so basically dark blue, right? So for example, here the temperature is low, right? And here the temperature is high because that's your exhaust. In your exhaust, the temperature is high, right? So that's what you're seeing here. And then uh, if I run the simulation a little bit more, the spark ignites, the flame friend propagates, expansion stroke occurs and this right here this temperature map that you have is called as the temperature distribution that affects your NOx and soot emissions now the nice thing about a simulation and the animation right now when you look at youtube videos you will see a lot of animation meaning they it looks very colorful it looks very cool but you cannot calculate engineering data but with a cfd simulation i can actually query so for example, at this particular point, if I put up, okay, maybe I should use a different color. Say at this point, right? At this point, if I want to get the temperature, I can get it. I can get the temperature as a function of crank angle. If I want to take the temperature in this entire space, and if I want to average it, I can do it. So that is the difference between a simulation and animation. With simulation, you can design engines. With animation, you cannot design engines, period. All right. So. What else can we, now one thing is here, let me just play this video again, right? So this is a cut plane, meaning you're creating a slice in the geometry. So you see, you feel like this, the flame is actually two dimensional, correct? You can see that it's just two dimensional. In reality, it's not two dimensional, it's actually three dimensional. So let's take a look at something called as the volume rendering. So this is like a volume rendering. It shows, it, we are showing temperature, all right? So before I start the simulation, let me, give you some pointers. So this right here is the intake. Okay. The intake is blue, right? Why? Because it's cold. It's cold. The exhaust and engine are at the same temperature because they very, they contain hot products. Now, if we play the, if I play the video, we are first starting with an exhaust stroke, right? So we're basically pushing whatever is there in the combustion chamber. We're pushing it to the exhaust and now intake is going to start. 
intake stroke is going to start. You can see that the intake valves are going to push open and then the cold charge comes inside the engine. So now your engine is cool because it contains the fresh mixture, right? Now we, have, we are basically going through the end of the intake. Everything is now cool. Now the piston is coming up again, right? The piston is coming up and it's going to slowly start and it's going to compress the charge. So that's why this blue is slowly turning in, turning to green color. And before, and if you wait, then what's going to happen? That's your combustion. That is the actual structure. Look, let's just play that again. That looks very beautiful, right? This is what you call as a flame front. Look at how complex the shape is. And that's how combustion takes place. Expansion stroke occurs. And your, the simulation stops exactly when the valves are going to open. So let me just maybe pause right there. So at this point, this three-dimensional temperature distribution, this is actually a 3D distribution, not a 2D distribution. This is what determines your NOx and suit emissions. Okay. All right. So with that, you know, I would like to conclude this workshop. Uh, I hope you guys found it useful. Right. Now, any questions, Vishnu and Aravind, that you guys want to ask? Did you find this interesting? Like, what, what do you feel about the simulation? If you have any comments, you know, that would be great. videos are more more interesting and easy to understand okay uh, in meshing can't we just define the gap and the number of meshes to be used well th then that would be over specifying the problem Vishnu see if you're specifying the gap right so think about it like this you're sitting in a rectangular room currently right just just look at the room that you're in and look at from the left hand side to the right hand side there is a particular length correct if you specify the number of points, you're automatically specifying the gaps. So you can't over specify the system. So for a, if you have, if you have, if a room, if a room is basically one meter long, and if you need only one point, which is in the middle, then you have two gaps, correct? One point is the end, one point is the, the other end, and one point is the gap. So if you have three points, you have two gaps, right? So the number of gaps is always equal to the number of points minus one. You can just draw a simple line and uh, figure it out. So that is why, can you unmute me? Yeah, absolutely, why not? Go for it, Vishnu. Uh, sir, what I wanted to ask is, uh, could you just, uh, if you wanted to mesh an area, uh, we mm -hmm. could just define the number of uh, mesh density for, uh, for the specified area, right? Yes. Uh, well, what do you mean by mesh density? Like, uh, oh, I have just done very basic fluent. Uh, I had mm -hmm. I couldn't complete it, but uh, while meshing in it, in ga I was using gambit and fluent. So while, right. in that while meshing, uh, there were like two options. One was uh, the number of meshes, and uh, the second one was something like I uh, choose a length, like or uh, I choose a part of the. Uh, model that I created and then I give so many number of meshes per centimeter. Right. Or right. See, that is, that is fine. The problem with using like a default mesh density is that these, when you run CFD simulations, right, there's a concept called as grid dependency, meaning your answers absolutely like hundred percent depends upon the number of computational mesh points you have. If you have the, if you have the incorrect number of mesh points, then your results will be completely wrong. All right, so here what we're doing is we're saying that, okay, my base grid size is 0.4 millimeters or four millimeters. So how does that work? Well, I can give an example. Okay, maybe this is low memory. <clears throat> so for simplicity, let's just take a 2D example, all right? So let us say that this is a two dimensional engine, correct? Now, what you do, you know this length. So this is the length of your liner. So when you are specifying the base grid size, what you're doing is you're specifying this size. 
Now, this is more meaningful because typically when you're running an IC engine simulation, right, there is a particular length scale that you need to capture, meaning your mesh size should be less than a particular distance. Only then your turbulence will be captured correctly and only then, turb uh, only then your flame propagation rate will be captured correctly. So that is why it is beneficial to specify delta Y and delta X. And then what you can do is you can do adaptive mesh refinement. So what happens is say that the fuel spray is coming in like this, correct? The, what the solver would do is the solver would automatically do this. And it would not just go there. It would just keep on doing it, you know, like to a very finer level so that you're capturing all that very, very accurately. This is the adaptive mesh refinement feature. So wouldn't this require a lot of time to complete the calculations? This is actually much more faster because in fuel, influent, right? So that is why, that is why converge is state of the art, meaning that is why you do it. That is why converge is basically used for IC engine simulations by all the companies and they're not using fluent. Why? Because in fluent, what you do is you would basically uh, your mesh size everywhere would be equal to this size. Uh, so the total cell count, if this is C1 and this is C2, C1 is quite higher. Greater than C2 is. And your total simulation time depends on this. Uh, yes. All right. And plus there are other criteria uh, which you might have not studied. There's a criteria called CFL number. There's something called a time step, right? Delta T. Uh, now these things, they're all coupled. So if you, like the, the nice thing about ANSYS Fluent is you can create like toy simulations very easily. But uh, the problem is since it's, since it's, since it has a graphical user interface, you cannot learn anything from it. Uh, okay. okay, cool. Anyway, all right guys. So thank you all for attending.